Well, good afternoon. Welcome back to the museum for the Vice Admiral and uh, Vice Admiral Ralph and Mrs. Shifley lecture presented by the class of 1950. Uh, this is the first of a three-part series. We've never done this before with our Shifley lectures for the past five years. So what we're going to do is going to have uh, beat the Commander Armstrong kick it off today. Uh, and because this is part of a greater effort, as many of you here on the yard know, we've been going through this preservation project of uh, flags over in Mahan Hall that have been there for a century. Uh, some of which midshipmen for a hundred years have walked by every day on their way to classes or to the professor's offices. Some have not been seen in one century because they were behind the War of 1812 flags. And the very quick story about those uh, as we'll see today, is we thought that they, they might be there. There were rumors that they might be there. There was a catalog of uh, a century ago that said that they were there. Uh, but our, according to our former historian, Jim Cheevers, who retired last year after 50 years, he said, well, they might be there. They might not. We're not sure if they were photographed and then removed. Uh, we don't know if even if they were there, they've been they've deteriorated and fallen to, into the molecules. Uh, we just don't know. So we found out, and that was in December with the first cases that were removed, and then uh, the next two cases were removed. And I want to thank uh, a couple of folks right now, uh, not the least of which is Charles here. Charles? Charles Swift is our managing director and supervisor and museum curator who made this all happen. Uh, Charles will give the, uh, one of the next talks, TBD, in the next month and a half or so, uh, about the flag project itself. And I'm going to give a talk, uh, also TBD, on one of the flags, and I will leave it to the general topic of Preble's Chinese Pirates. And for those naval historians out there who think that uh, the, the timeline is off, I'll explain it when I speak. Um, but I do want to mention uh, the incredible crew Camille and her crew from Museum Textile Services, they were contracted to remove and uh, preserve these flags for us. They've done a phenomenal job, and they've done it in the finest tradition of Amelia Fowler, who had started this project a century ago with her 40 seamstresses. And uh, Camille, you all couldn't be better to work with the professionalism that you've displayed, the, the information that you've given us has really opened our, our eyes, especially in my case, to, to a lot of this. So thank you for what you have done here. Um, I also, we have a couple of things here. We do have one of the, the original flags from the Korean expedition that BJ will talk about momentarily. Uh, the rifle you see uh, after BJ's, BJ's talk, uh, Chaplain Burns is going to stop by. That's actually his weapon. Uh, we take things pretty seriously at the Naval Academy uh, when chaplains have them the old rifles. Uh, so uh, he's going to just talk for a couple of minutes about that one. And uh, this is a letter, actually, from uh, Commodore uh, Rogers to Augustus Ludlow Case uh, about the expedition. And the reason why I mention this, uh, this letter in particular is because it's part of the entire Augustus Ludlow Case letters. Until about four years ago, they were all in this big metal box up in the attic that had been there for about 40 odd years. And two incredible research volunteers, Teresa DeGudis and her partner in crime, have been working on this diligently. I think you're at 38, 48 bo uh, boxes of letters now that you've inventoried. And so, and so we now have a really uh, fantastic sense of uh, the role that Augustus Ludlow Case played in American naval history and will be available to uh, researchers and writers of the future. So we get on to the uh, main event for this. Uh, people who have come to the museum will know B.J. Armstrong. I uh, have often said, and I will always say, Commander Armstrong is the most, most prolific uh, author on active duty today, and probably in a very, very long time. Um, and I appreciate everything that, that B.J. has done and the support he's given to the museum and help us understand naval history more. And uh, when he and I were looking at the original cases as they were coming down, uh, we saw so many stories that were available to authors and speakers, and this one was just prime territory for Dr. Commander E.J. Armstrong, and please help me welcome him. That's fine. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Claude, for the invitation to join you all today. 
end of the class in 1950 for their support to the museum and the Shifley Lectures for helping make sure these events go off as smoothly as they do. Thank you to everybody for coming and to those who are going to watch in the future online. So in 1866, an American-owned merchant ship named the General Sherman took it upon itself to open up American trade with the Korean coast. The Koreans, like the Japanese before the arrival of Commodore Perry and his ships in the 1850s, they jealously guarded their isolation, and they did not believe that Western traders had anything to offer them besides trouble. They were known in the West as the Hermit Kingdom, and the General Sherman never returned. The ship had a polyglot crew made up of its American owner and captain, as well as British adventurers, a missionary, Malay and Chinese sailors, and they had been accused of participating in the Taiping Rebellion, as well as in piracy events along the Chinese coast. Stocked with trade goods that they had obtained from the British and Chinese waters, the armed steamer had tried to make its way up the Taidong River without permission or coordination from the local governments. Now what happened next is a little unclear from the documentary record, but the Korean government claimed that the Sherman's crew threatened Korean safety and kidnapped a local official and his bodyguards. After the ship's captain and owner refused to turn over the hostages and then fired into a group of civilians on shore with their cannon, the local governor ordered his militia to attack. The crew was killed in the process. Rumors were that some had escaped, and these rumors spread across the Yellow Sea to China. And despite the unsavory nature of the General Sherman's crew, and let's be honest, the American government didn't really see these as what they were looking for in official representation, the State Department and the Navy still needed to find answers as to what had happened. Korea nominally owed its allegiance at the time to the Qin Dynasty of China. But when U.S. Minister to China Frederick Lowe inquired with the court in Peking about the incident, he was assured that Korea retained a measure of its own sovereignty and its own foreign relations. Basically, the court said, ask the Koreans. In 1867, Robert Schutfeldt took the USS Wachusett to Korea to determine the fate of the Sherman and its crew, but poor weather kept him from reaching the Taidong River and he had to turn back. While the mission was a failure, it did spark in Schufelt a continuing interest in Korea that would have a lasting impact on American diplomacy in the Pacific. The following year, in 1868, Captain John Feibiger, in command of USS Shenandoah, did make contact with the Koreans and officially inquired about the Sherman and its crew. The Koreans were polite but adamant that the Americans must leave. They offered an official letter and documents explaining what had happened to the Sherman and its crew. And it's from that that we get the story of the hostage taking and the firing into the crowd. Now, after these intermittent attempts to determine what had happened to the Sherman, Rear Admiral John Rogers took command of the U.S. Asiatic Squadron. With it, he brought the intention to claim the glory that Matthew Perry had earned in Japan several decades earlier. The U.S. government did not appear to be overly upset about what had happened to the Sherman, taking the Korean story of violence and misbehavior at face value. But what that incident illustrated to the U.S. officials was the need for a treaty with Korea in order to protect American sailors and potentially to open up the Hermit Kingdom to American trade. With USS Colorado as its flagship, the squadron under Rogers sailed from Nagasaki in the spring of 1871 and arrived on the Korean coast in May. The expedition was a joint effort by the Americans. Minister Frederick Lowe from the State Department shipped aboard the squadron leaving his embassy in Peking to serve as the State Department's representative. And after picking their way through the narrow channels and early summer fog banks and bad weather, the squadron anchored on 30 May in the port that we know today as Incheon. As the ship settled into their anchorages, Lowe sent a message ashore announcing the American intentions and their desire for a peaceful treaty to be negotiated with the Kingdom of Korea. In particular, the American effort wanted to ensure the safety of American merchant sailors who entered Korean waters, either safety from the Koreans themselves 
or a guarantee of their proper care if they were shipwrecked or encountered a storm. Local officials were dubious, and likely for good reason. The incident with the Sherman was not their only recent interaction with the West. The French Navy had arrived in Korean waters just a few months after the American ship had been dispatched. French forces landed and attacked the town on Kangawa Island in a monastery in the hills in retaliation for the execution of French missionaries by the Koreans. However, Korean forces had pushed back the French troops, forced them to withdraw, and forced the French Navy to abandon its blockade. Korean desire to maintain its distance from the rest of the world was reinforced by the continued efforts of unsavory Westerners and adventurers in attempts to trick or force the Koreans into trade. There's even a story of a German merchant who took the Korean leader's father's remains hostage in order to negotiate a good treaty. He barely escaped back to China with his life. When Korean officials replied to Lowe's initial communication and told him that the US mission was unwelcome and they should leave, things got only more complicated. Lowe refused to acknowledge them. Instead, he insisted, as Matthew Perry had two decades before in Japan, that he would only speak with an official representative of the royal court in Seoul. The Koreans stonewalled this request. Now, while Lowe communicated ashore with the Korean officials, Rogers also followed Perry's example by putting his small boats and steam launches into the water to begin surveying operations. They wanted to map the coastline of Korea. Now, American naval officers saw surveying as an important peacetime mission in this era. They were helping to make the waters of Asia safe for Western sailors as they exploited the seas for growing global trade. What they called the savage coasts could be made safer not just through naval and diplomatic power, but also through the judicious use of science. The Koreans saw things differently. As the swarm of boats worked their way along the beaches and up the Sally River, local officials and military commanders recognized that the effort was a violation of Korean sovereignty. The Americans were moving into Korean territory. They were taking measurements. They were gathering intelligence. What the US naval officers saw as an effort in the name of science and of civilization, the Koreans saw as an attack on their legitimacy and potentially their national well-being. Now, one of the interesting elements of the 1871 operation is it's one of the very first overseas expeditions that took a photographer along with them. The squadron documented their efforts in and around Kangawa Island extensively. And many of the images that you've been seeing on the screen are actually from operations in Korea. Here we have the watch officers on board Colorado collecting the data from the surveying teams and working on their charting. And in the bottom corner of the slide, we have a photograph of what the Americans called the gateway to the empire and what we today know of as the estuary around Incheon. Once they arrived in Korean waters, the crew of the gunboat Monocacy gathered together on the forecastle for their own photograph as a crew as the photographer moved from ship to ship amongst the squadron. And you can actually see their mascot, the dog, down there in the center at the very bottom. Now, Frederick Lowe, the ambassador from Peking, who's standing at the far right in this photograph, brought his assistant, Mr. Edward Drew, along with him, and a pair of translators that they had hired in China and worked for the embassy. As the Korean local officials and negotiators came on board Colorado, in a couple of instances, the photographer also took pictures of them. There's not a really a lot of data to go along with this photo, but it looks like maybe an older individual on the on the right, with a younger one on the left, perhaps this is a bodyguard, much like the hostages that were taken. Now, as the gunboats Monocacy and Palos put their surveying teams in the water and moved up and down the rivers, their crews in the boats ran across local junks, 
and interacted with local mariners and local crews, of which we have the pictures here. The surveyors collected their soundings and their data and made their sketches, and they began constructing charts of the river and the waters around Kangawa Island. Here you can see one of their kind of final outputs with in the center the island itself, and you can see the sketching of the channels and the soundings up along the north end of the island as well. Uh, if you zoom in on this map, it also marks the locations of certain element of the battles which are to come. Now with both sides posturing, military forces prepared for escalation, and the diplomats continued to miscommunicate with each other, things rapidly came to a head. When the American boats approached the end of the island, the north end of the island, on June 1st, the local commander ordered his forts to open fire on the Americans. As shots splashed into the water around the small boats and launches, USS Monocacy, here on the left, and Palos, here on the right, moved into position and began returning fire with their howitzers. The Americans continued to pour fire into the Korean emplacements until they saw soldiers abandoning their positions and retreating inland. Rogers and Lowe quickly decided that the bombardment had not been enough. The Koreans needed to be punished. Rogers called together his captains and he began planning a punitive expedition to demonstrate American resolve and to defend the American flag. Lowe delivered an ultimatum to the Koreans. Unless they apologized and began treaty negotiations by 10 June, the Americans would attack. If you do the math here, the Americans are giving themselves a little bit over a week to plan their operation and get their crews ready. The American officers organized a force of over 500 sailors and 100 Marines for the landing party. In this photograph, you can see Rear Admiral Rogers on the far right, pointing at something on the chart there gathered with his captains as they planned the mission. Meanwhile, lookouts reported that Korean troop movements showed that the garrisons were being reinforced with local militias. Both sides continued to posture. Both sides continued to stalemate the negotiations. Marine Corps Captain McLean Tilton, who commanded the Marines in the assault, wrote to his wife, quote, you may imagine it's not with great pleasure that I anticipate landing with this small force that we have. And he ominously noted that what he called the savages were known for fighting to the death. Now Tilton had been commissioned as a Marine in 1861 as the Civil War was beginning and he was promoted to first lieutenant just six months after he had been brought uh, into the Marine Corps. He served in the West Blockade Squadron, West Coast Blockade Squadron, and in the defense of Pensacola after the Battle of Santa Rosa Island. He was a native Marylander, and he spent three tours here in Annapolis as the commanding officer of the Marine Barracks and Marine Guard, as well as retiring here at the end of his service. Before his retirement as a Lieutenant Colonel in 1897, he had deployed to the Asiatic Squadron as well as the European Squadron in command of deployed detachments of Marines. As the deadline for Minister Lowe's ultimatum passed, the American force launched their operation and their amphibious attack on the island. But Tilton's worries came to naught. As the gunboats pulled the landing craft into position, you can see USS Monocacy here, the sailors and Marines executed the plan with little formal resistance. The most challenging part of the landing operation was actually the knee-deep mud that the boats landed in and the sailors and Marines had to carry their equipment through. You can see them struggling with the artillery here in a painting by John Clymer. Uh, this painting used to hang in the Commandant of the Marine Corps' office in the 1950s. And on the far side, you can see a photograph of the rocky and mud-strewn coast that they had to overcome. Now the Americans had superior weapons. They brought their own artillery ashore and they had the heavy cannons of the warships to provide fire support to their mission. Over the course of two days, the sailors and Marines organized and attacked three forts in sequence. The Koreans, with older and less advanced cannon, poor aim and slow reloading, really made an ineffective defense. <clears throat> 
After the initial landing, the Marines and sailors established their perimeters and assaulted the first and smallest of the emplacements. It went without much of a hitch, and they made camp for the night before planning to attack the other two at first light. In the final assault on Kangawa Island's main and largest fort to the north, charging sailors and Marines with their bayonets fixed swarmed over the walls and into brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Koreans. But it appeared that the training and professionalism of the American sailors and Marines was far superior to the local militias. The result of the battle was a very lopsided American victory. As Korean flags and banners were hauled down and the stars and stripes rose above the flagpole in the main fort, three cheers went up from the warships in the river. Here we can see some of the Marines with one of the buildings that was captured inside one of the forts. And here we have the aftermath of some of the fighting. Lieutenant Commander Winfield Scott Schley, who would go on to major command against the Spanish fleet in the Spanish-American War, estimated that the Koreans suffered over 350 casualties. American casualties included only three dead, including Naval Academy graduate Lieutenant Hugh McKee and a handful more wounded. Here we see Marines and sailors standing up atop the walls of the fort. This is the second of the captured forts and was renamed by the Americans Fort Monocacy. Yet this military action, while tactically very successful, accomplished very little. The American expedition had certainly bloodied Korean forces and captured their flags. Here we can see the Korean leader's personal banner, nicknamed the Generalissimo by the Americans. It's currently on loan back to South Korea for a museum exhibit there. But officials continued to refuse to negotiate after the operation. The local government would not even send a letter to the court in Seoul from Frederick Lowe. They insisted that the embarrassment and disrespect shown from the attack had made the king furious, and that they would be punished just for forwarding the letter. The squadron took stock of its position after the fighting. Two of Roger's ships were leaking. They had run into rocks in the river during the operation, and his magazines were nearly empty of ammunition. The admiral and Lowe had expected their demonstration of tactical excellence to force the negotiation to continue. Instead, they realized that efforts might very well be futile. Neither side was willing to budge. Neither side was willing to give in to the other's negotiating points. Despite the fact that Rogers wrote to his friend, Commodore Augustus Case, that he had vindicated the American flag, the combat operations and loss of life on both sides seemed to have almost no effect to the mission. Frustrated, Running low of supplies, the ships of the squadron weighed anchor on 3 July and set sail to return Ambassador Lo to China. Now, after departing the peninsula, Rear Admiral Rogers reported to the Secretary of the Navy with his recommendations on how to proceed. He believed that the only way to bring the Korean court to heel was an invasion. He believed that what he advocated in his letter to SECNAV was deploying three to 5,000 U.S. Army regulars, preferably veterans of the most recent U.S. Civil War, to attack the Koreans, occupy their capital, and force them into a treaty. Escalation, in Rogers' view, was the only way to redeem American honor. Now, it appears that the administration of Ulysses S. Grant simply ignored the suggestion. After beating back a French expedition in 1866, then the American incident in 1871, Korean isolationism hardened. But as Japan strengthened during the Meiji Restoration, they forced their own trade treaty with Seoul in 1876, and it created an opportunity for the United States to return. Commodore Robert Schufelt turned to diplomacy and negotiation rather than threats of invasion and military strikes in order to achieve American aims in Korea. After his failure to make contact while commanding Wachusett back in 1867, 
He was sent back to Korean waters again at the end of the 1870s. He first attempted to use the US relationship with Japan to open negotiations from that direction. When that failed, he turned the court in Peking to attempt to work as an intermediary. When that also failed, he returned home. But in 1880, or I'm sorry, in 1883, after his promotion to Rear Admiral, he returned to China. He was posted to Peking to serve as an ambassador. And he built on his previous efforts with the Chinese Viceroy Li Hongzhong and successfully negotiated the Western Treaty that opened Korea, making the Hermit Kingdom open to American merchants. Now the Korean expedition is still mentioned in the curriculum taught to midshipmen here at the Naval Academy. But it's just a small moment in a survey of American naval history that spans almost 250 years over the course of 16 weeks. It offers some small detail in the narrative of expansionism and foreign relations of the US at the end of the 19th century. Now despite the minor role in their studies, when the recent conservation project in Mahan Hall revealed the lost banners, flags, and lances captured during the expedition, Midshipmen streamed into Mahan Hall between classes to look at the artifacts of the past. Together with their professors, they admired the condition of the materials, the preserved colors, the decorative feathers and markings. And suddenly, the events on the Korean Peninsula didn't seem quite so long ago or far away. In our present-minded social media world, we easily forget that the United States' experience with Asia and the Pacific dates back nearly to the founding of the nation. The first American merchant voyages returned from the far side of the world in the 1790s. And USS Essex was the first American warship to round the Cape of Good Hope bound for East Asian waters in 1800, under the command of Edward Preble, who this building is named for. In the case of the Korean expedition, the history involved military escalation and diplomatic failures from both sides. It involved questions of sovereignty, and a regime that feared for its survival. It involved military operations which, while clearly tactically successful, did not achieve their stated goals and seemed to have little strategic value. Sorry. Now the treaty was finally negotiated, but it was a decade later, and not through military threats, but via diplomacy. Diplomacy <clears throat> led by the Navy and a naval officer a vital part of American foreign relations in the Pacific then, as they still are today. The midshipmen visiting the flags and artifacts benefit from understanding these observations and the wider context of the US role in the Pacific. This understanding will serve them well as they move into the fleet and they rise through the ranks to become our senior leaders. In our contemporary digital world, Sometimes we forget that the US relationship with the Korean Peninsula has been made through over 150 years of history. Thank you. So as Claude said, we have a couple of the artifacts here to show you. Uh, the, uh, the US Navy 1870 Springfield rifle, one of, the, one of the banners taken from one of the forts as well as the letter to Augustus Case that I referenced in the talk. Um, but before we get to those, I'll, I'll take any questions first that you might have. So this was up the Thaley River, right? How far from the Inchon Line was it? Do you know? How far how, how from it? So it's hard. The, the estuary has changed in its size and shape today. Um, it was not that far from what we know of as the landings. Um, but in terms of like distance and stuff like that, I don't have an exact number for you. Uh, there is an American uh, in, in Korea who has studied this and wrote a PhD dissertation actually on this operation itself. Uh, and he has a fascinating website that shows some overlay imagery of modern Incheon with some of these charts from the era. Um, and I can share that with you afterwards. Yeah, uh, a few bills last attempt to get the Korean Treaty, what changed between them and, and the Peking government to actually the, to make that breakthrough? So the, the, the Meiji Restoration in Japan and the changing dynamics of Japan's role in the region, uh, some historians have linked that to the change in, in the mind of the Chinese court. 
in that if the Japanese are going to have this treaty with Korea, the Japanese are going to begin exerting influence over Korea, influence that belongs to China in their mind in that, in that era. So they would need to operate as an intermediary. Um, you know, the, the tension between China and Japan and Korea goes back even centuries before this. Um, so it, it makes some rational sense that the, uh, the diplomacy within that triangle helps drive things. Just for most people to know, the uh, Marine uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tillotson? Captain Tilton at the yeah. time, yep. Was actually from 9 Maryland Avenue was his street address. Uh, where he retired to, but he described himself as Napolitan. And his manuscripts are at Quantico, as mm -hmm. far as we can tell. Yes. Yeah, and, and the, that's exactly right. His, what, what remain of his letters and papers are down at Quantico at the Marine Corps History's archives. PJ, what was, was the source for most of the photos that you used? So the, these, these photos, actually, I obtained them through the Navy Library and the NHHC website. And so you can find most of them there. Um, in, in particular, the I'll flip back here. The chart itself is available in a, uh, in a dot .tiff image, uh, very detailed. And so you can download that and kind of zoom in. And, and as I said during the talk, uh, many of the, we can't read them in this version of the image, but many of these markings show where some of the bombardments happened, where some of the uh, engagements, the first engagements happened with the surveying boats. Uh, so it's all there on that chart. Just a random thought, in um, in light of Japan's role in opening up Korea and knowing that, I don't know if my, my dates are quite right, that there were um, that the Japanese were sending um, naval officers to get trained here. Any idea if, if whether those uh, the ones from that who were trained in Annapolis and went back to Japan, did they, you know, if they played any role? Uh, that's an interesting question. I have no idea. Yeah, my research hasn't gone that that deep. No, it's a good question, though. All right, chaps, you want to come talk about the one? Sure. The rifle. I brought one of my rifles, which is a early Marine Corps, U.S. Navy, 1870, which is in the type of one of the type of rifles that were used during this expedition. I'm not quite sure if this exact model was here. We had two models at this time. One is a carbine, and this is the longer version of the infantry uh, weapon. Uh, it did have a didn't play a part in the report of the after action report, not because of the failure of this mechanism, but rather the failure of the, of the ammunition. And uh, I wanted to bring that up. I thought that was an interesting point. Uh, Captain uh, Tilton did an excellent, in his letter, after action report, and uh, I'll read a little bit of that to you. It says, I trust will be not considered out of place in this connection to mention that I've picked up from the field numbers of copper shell cartridges unexploded, although the shell bore evidence of having been well struck by the firing pins. Upon the firing, the filing of the heads in some of these shells, so I just exposed a tin cup holding the fulminate I found the appearance of oxidation around the cavity holding the fulminate, and on the inside of silver cases, I found the tin surface of the cup entirely gone, and one sixteenth of an inch of what looked like the rust of iron filling the bottom of the cup. Upon inquiry, I found the men complained of the cartridges packed in paper boxes, while no complaint was heard from them who had been furnished with cartridges in wooden boxes. From the great number of unexploded cartridges I saw in the field, although having a deep indentation in their heads from the pins, I am led to think that it will be dangerous to trust in any of the cartridges in the fleet packed in paper boxes and marked Frankfurt Arsenal, 1869, and I believe that at least 25% of them are totally, utterly worthless. <laughs> really good after action report, and also a good uh, thing to remember your chemistry. When you, when you take uh, th those cartridges were made with uh, copper casings with an iron, a tinned iron cup, and of course you add a reactive compound like mercury fulminate, which is the, the base for uh, a primer, and a little bit of humidity, you end up having a galvanic reaction, which of course ruins the, the, the iron and rusts it completely and makes it inert. And so today I have a, not only the rifle, but we have some cartridges that come from that, from that casing. These are modern. And of course, they're made with brass, 
casings with a brass cup, and we've also removed uh, the, el the chemical element that is uh, corrosive as part of the mercury fulminate. So uh, if you want to take a look at these, come on up and have a, have a little idea of what's going on here. Uh, the lessons are chemistry and uh, after action reports, good after action reports. And uh, to come on up and, and take a look at the rifle because uh, it is an original 1870. So. And, and Admiral Rogers mentions the problem with the cartridges as well in his letter to Augustus Case. He spends a whole paragraph on it. He is beside himself that this has happened to his forces. He seems to connect them to the lever action carbines that the crew had with them, not necessarily the, the longer rifles. Um, but then again, I would probably give the Marine a better knowledge of that than maybe the Admiral. So. So we'll, we'll have to think about that. His letter just, his letter just says, just use the term carbine. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't specify what model carbine it was. Okay. Jeffs, did they ever, did they correct that after they received the, the after action report? I believe they did. Part of it is just keeping the, the ammunition properly sealed, not just in waxed paper, but actually have it boxed in the lead sealed envelopes. And then uh, over time they, got rid of the, the, the copper, which is a very easily damaged cartridge. Once it's in the field and you, and you, 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 you deform it anyway, it won't be easily loaded or extracted from the weapon, and then you, you, you run it under the service, on service pole, so. Claude, did you or one of your folks want to talk about the, the banner? Uh, you know, I wasn't sure. Can I was Certainly. All right. Um, we were interested to see that half of these banners have a, the Points binding on the left and have, have them on the right, which, but only one side was um, designed to be seen. So that's not something I generally find in flags from the United States. Uh, what we're looking at is one of the Korean flags that were, was removed from Case 31 at Mahan Hall this week. Uh, all of the beige linen you see is the background that Amelia Fowler and her crew placed the flag on in 1912-1913. The blue that you see, that's original silk that's deteriorated, including this beautiful light patterned silk in the middle. Uh, up in the corner where it's better preserved, you can still see it has a cloud and dragon pattern. It's uh, just a, a beautiful, what we call self-patterning silk. This design of the winged snake we see on other Korean banners. And um, Mrs. Fowler has used paint and stitching to reinforce the image, which um, perhaps had faded over time. On the left is the hoist binding. You can see three ties that remain that tied it to a post that we removed it from. On the post, there was a crown of uh, pheasant feathers, and some, uh, some of these posts have goat hair. Uh, unfortunately, it, it has deteriorated with age and exposure and being uh, exposed to gravity for 100 years. But uh, what remains is, is simply astonishing. And we're very lucky to have a number of these Korean flags. Does anybody have any more questions? So what did you find this past week? I, I went to take it over here. Uh, this was this is one of the ones that we found. So in uh, December we found uh, some of the Korean banners, about half of them, as well as the Chinese pirate flag from 1854. Uh, the cases that were removed, 29 and 30 uh, this week. Is it 29 and 30? Uh, 30, 31. Uh, 30, 31. Sorry, one of them had uh, more Korean banners and a couple of uh, the guidons. You know, all the midshipmen here are familiar with guidons. They had them then, so you'll, when we start to put photos again on Facebook of some of these, you'll see how the Korean uh, soldiers were formed up just like you are. They had guidons, and you'll see that they have, uh, in the original in December they still had the feathers, but they didn't have the feathers had been um, consumed. I guess is the right word uh, in 100 years from the second case, and then in the last case, uh, some replicas from the uh, Spanish American War. Not really, because it's original. Oh, these were, sorry, my apologies. They were originals from the Spanish American can we, can we bring the screen back up for a second? Yeah, yeah sure. The, the awesome. lances that the guidons are on, there's actually, it, they actually appear in the images. So you can actually see it right here. Oh, yeah. Right? And so the, the headpiece of the lance and the feathers are almost exactly what we see from the artifacts that were just recovered. Roger. What happened to the prisoners that were taken? The, were they returned to the Koreans? Yes, the Korean prisoners were returned um, at the end of, uh, as, the, as the fleet weighed anchor to sail away. The, it was pretty clear that Admiral Rogers and uh, Ambassador Lowe 
didn't want that complication to have to deal with. I just wonder. Um, and if, by the way, uh, for any of you who are wondering why we have these, um, there were a series of statutes and executive orders, uh, the first one being during the War of 1812 when Congress determined that I think they appropriated $500 for the preservation of uh, flags captured in combat. Uh, President Polk uh, issued an executive order stating that any flags captured by naval forces would be uh, preserved and exhibited at the United States Naval Academy, which is how they wound up here, and why we are the official repository of all flags that are captured by naval, U.S. naval forces. Uh, there was subsequent legislation in, uh, in the early 1900s just that led to uh, the flags going up to Mahan Hall. And in fact, you'll still see a plaque just as you enter the main door, the double doors of Mahan. Go to the left, there's a plaque, and that's dedicated to the flags. So there, there is legal authority for, for us to have these, and we respect them by uh, continuing to preserve them, uh, hopefully in perpetuity. That's our job here at the museum. So, and part of our job also is to inform the general public, which is why we have these Shaifu lectures, and especially grateful to BJ, Chaplain Burns, uh, and Camille for explaining some of the uh, flags that, that we have been seeing, uh, again, for the first time in more than 100 years. So, uh, great. I might just point out to everybody, if you don't know, some uh, medals were awarded for valor in this expedition, and we have one of them on permanent display downstairs in our exhibit. And if I remember right, I think it was this private who got one of the medals, of medal, you got a medal of honor for this one? Is that correct? Now that I don't know. Oh, okay, it's a medal it's of honor. Down the have downstairs. Sorry, it's down the second deck. I'm pretty sure. All right. Um, that concludes today's uh, presentation. I thank you for coming. Please uh, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We're posting as many photos of this entire project as we can. And uh, in a few weeks, I'll give that talk on uh, Preble's Chinese Pirates. And then following that, Charles will give the talk on the overall uh, flag project. So thank you very much. And uh, spread the word about the museum. All right, thanks a lot.